terrain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today and faithful you have been and faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you father the orphan your kindness makes us whole and you shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own you're making me like you clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes for you will have your bride free of all her guilt and rid of all her shame and known by her true name and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips and you will be praised and you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised and you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips You give life, and you give life. You are love, and you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord, and it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. Great are you, Lord. Let's sing that again. You give life. You give life. And you are love. And you bring light to the darkness. You give hope. And you restore 
Every heart that is broken and great are you, Lord. And it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. And great are you, Lord. the earth and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only and great are you Lord sing that one more time yes great are you Lord let us pray Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to enter your presence. God, we thank you for your faithfulness and for your love. God, even when we don't deserve it, and God, that's all the time, we don't deserve it. But God, we thank you for that. We thank you for giving us that breath in our lungs. God, that so we can praise you, that your praise will forever be on our lips, God. We thank you that your mercies are new. We thank you for a new day. We thank you for a new chance, God. And God, we thank you for the hope that you've given us through Jesus Christ. And I pray that you help us be more like him with every breath, God. We pray that as we enter your scripture, God, that you would be with us. God, that we would understand it, comprehend it, learn from it, and live it, God. We pray these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. You all may have a seat.
three great weeks. I mean, just the fellowship, we cook like crazy for them. Three to four hundred people every week for three different weeks. And it's just a delight. I have a comedy character who shows up every year at that called Clyde Dorkman. And Clyde is a rock star. He's got his own fan club with T-shirts and everything else. And basically, all he does is get up and tell jokes about old people. And uh, <clears throat> a few years ago, he told, uh, told the story of an old man that he met. looked like he was in his 80s, just crying and weeping. And Clyde said, what's the, what's the problem? And the guy said, oh, I'm just so in love with my 25-year-old wife. And the guy said, well, that sounds great. What's wrong with that? And he goes, no, you don't understand Every morning she gets up and makes biscuits and gravy from scratch. It's awesome. She gives me a big kiss and goes off to work. She comes home at lunch, gives me a big hug, fixes me a nice little lunch. And then coming home from work in the afternoon, she picks up a, a quart of my favorite ice cream and comes home and cooks me a gourmet meal. And then we snuggle up on the couch and eat ice cream and watch football. It's just wonderful. And the guy, Clyde, said so... Uh, what, you've just discovered she's only with you for your money? And the guy goes, no, I, I can't remember where I live. <laughs> Man, it's, it's pretty terrible when you forget about something that is so good. And yet, apparently, that's happening in our nation. I just got a report this week that as a grandpa, I especially find as a troubling report. It's from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University. Every year they put out what they call the American Worldview Inventory. This was their Worldview Inventory for 2020. What is the general worldview that many Americans, and they study the different generations, and what they just divulged in their research is that we've always known there was a generation gap. You know, up until the late 60s, there wasn't much of a generation gap. Leave it to Beaver days, you know, the Andy Griffith days, there wasn't much of a gap. Late 60s, early 70s, we started talking about the generation gap. More recent decades, we've talked about the faith gap. But what the research that they just released this week shows is that there's not a faith gap, there's a faith canyon, especially between my generation, baby boomers, you know, the, uh, our generation, and the newest, youngest generation that's among us. Basically, the generation I teach at the university. So it's not true, obviously, about everybody in that generation. There are people that are on fire for the Lord. But generally speaking, the study shows that uh, among the younger generation in America right now, there is a robust rejection of the Christian faith. Their study of what I guess we would call millennials was that they are disengaging from traditional Christianity. They're less likely to believe in absolute moral truth, less likely to view the Bible as a, a, a relevant, authoritative, moral guide, less likely to be committed to practicing their faith, to pray and worship during a typical week, to confess their sins, to believe that God created humans in His image, to believe that God loves them unconditionally, that generally speaking, they are more likely to wonder if God is really involved in their lives at all, and they're more likely to believe that having a faith matters more than which faith you have, as long as you believe something. And the, uh, basically, I said, it's, it's not a faith gap. There's a faith canyon, and America is losing its spiritual unity. Well, as a grandpa whose kids are growing up in that environment and in that generation, I've got concerns. It reminded me of something I read... Forty more or more years ago, in Lois Cheney's book, God is No Fool, she says, Today I experienced real fear. A friend came and talked to me. We sat across from each other and talked and talked, and he poured out his mind and heart because he is rejecting the faith of his childhood, the faith of his family, of his heritage, and he is doing so after painful, careful, sincere thought. He's grown bitter and resentful. He calmly condemned all organized religion. His examples were clear, pertinent, and occasionally had the smack of truth. But having had years of training in our faith, he has rejected it and wanders now in search of some kind of a belief system that will provide meaning for a new set of values. But his one sure conviction at this point is that wherever that answer is, it's not going to be in Christianity as we know it today. 
Now, I am convinced that he's going to search and find some kind of values. I'm also equally convinced that his rejected faith is providing him with that need for some values. That his rejected faith is giving him a frame of reference for those values, whether he recognizes that or not. I asked him if he would train his children in any religious belief, and he replied no. So I asked him where his children would get their frame of reference for a set of values, where they would find a foundation for their lives. And he looked past me out of the window and said softly several times, I don't know. I don't know. We talked gently on and on until it had grown dark, and I felt fear, real fear. May God have mercy on my friend. I've been in ministry for 47 years, and over those 47 years, I have frequently agonized over someone that I have seen just leave the church. Someone who's so involved, a very practicing Christian, deeply involved in the life of our church, and then they're just gone. And I'm not talking about somebody who just left for some reason went to another church. I mean, that still hurts, but that's okay. I'm talking about people who have walked away from faith in and service to Jesus Christ. And often I've had a chance to talk to those people. And it's been very frustrating because I'm sad to say that in my experience, there are some lost sheep who are determined to stay lost, who don't even know they're lost. And really kind of wish the preacher would get lost who keeps bugging him about it. These have been people who have been members of my church, people who have been fellow vocational ministers, former students of mine that went to the mission field, and then at one point just said, I don't think I believe this anymore, just, just walked away. How does that happen? Desertion, defecting from the faith. Well, there may be many reasons, but I want us today to look at some that I've found and uh, Jeremiah was living in times very similar to ours. So if you want to find Jeremiah while I'm in, or kind of introducing this, just turn to the middle of your Bible and turn left. And you'll find Jeremiah pretty quickly. It's one of the big books. He was a major prophet. So you can find it. Look at chapter 2 in Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah was living in a nation that used to love God. The foundation of the whole nation was faith in God. Look, about, look at, talk about how did that happen? How can people so easily defect from the faith, desert. And basically, if you look over at verse 19, he says, I'm warning you, this isn't going to end good. Over at verse 19, he says, your wickedness will punish you. Your backsliding will rebuke you. Consider then and realize how evil and bitter it is for you if you forsake the Lord your God and you have no more awe of me. He says, this, you're going the wrong way. It's not a good direction. How did that happen that they got to that point? Well, I want to point out maybe five things that I've found here in chapter 2 that I think may help us to understand a little bit, give us a little bit of a warning. And, and by the way, I'm, make clear, I'm not, I'm not talking about the general cultural decline of America, all the political turmoil and racial turmoil and all this stuff. I'm not talking about that general American cultural decline because that's to be expected. I'm not surprised when unbelievers act like unbelievers. I'm not surprised when pagans act like pagans. But people that don't believe in God, is, that's not going to be a pretty picture. I'm talking about members of the family of God. In fact, the warning right here in verse 4, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, O you clans of the house of God. These are people that are members of the family of God that I'm talking about today. Now, I don't know all the answers, but let me suggest five from chapter two here. The first, first insight is that defecting from the faith or deserting the kingdom of God hardly ever happens quickly. Uh, you look there at verses five, six, and seven. What does he say? He says, you know, this started a long time ago. What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols. They became worthless themselves. They never asked where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt? You know, he, he says I, in verse 7, I brought you into this fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. And then you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. You know, God's saying through the prophet, this has been a long, slow slide that started with your forefathers. I don't know 
that I've ever seen an instant defection from the faith. Somebody just wakes up one morning and says, nope, I don't believe this anymore. It's always been a slow erosion of faith over time. You know, Satan can get us to leave if he can get us to forget two things. If he can get us to forget how terrible it was to be lost, and if he can get, can get us to forget how wonderful it was to get saved. If you ever reach the point where you just forget how terrible it was to be lost, how wonderful it was to get saved, you get lackadaisical, you start letting your guard down, you start compromising in one little area, and then you compromise in another little area, usually starts in your thought life with some stray thoughts moving out here and there, and then those sinful thoughts lead to some doubtful thoughts. Well, why, why wouldn't God want me to do that? Why wouldn't God let me do that? That was the temptation of the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? You know, that God's trying to keep something good away from you. And yet these sinful thoughts lead to doubtful thoughts, which lead to kind of doubting God's character. It's not, that, not that we doubt God's existence, we just doubt his character. He must not be good if he won't let me do this. And then eventually that impacts your heart, and that begins to impact what we do with our fleshly bodies from the head to the heart, out to our fleshly bodies. That's a, usually a long, slow process. King David, we read in 2 Samuel chapter 11, loved, he was a man after God's own heart. That's how the Bible defines him. But he went into a period of life where he started getting lazy, started getting this entitlement, I deserve a break, I deserve a little treat, and it led to a moral disaster. Now, he never defected from God's kingdom, but it sure brought about some terrible consequences for decades after that. I mean, there were people who gave David a warning when David saw this beautiful woman taking a bath and said, hey, go, go find out who that is. David was married. The messenger comes back and says, she's married. She's the wife of Uriah. She's the daughter of Eliam. I mean, the, 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 the messenger was trying to say, oh, king, don't do this. She's somebody's little girl. She's somebody's wife. But David... It was a long, slow process that led to that disaster. If we start compromising, we're sliding down a path towards defection and desertion. If you've been around Florida much, you know that they have something down there. We have a few of them in East Tennessee, but not nearly as much as Florida. They're called sinkholes. And you'll see some $800,000 house. It's just beautiful landscape lawns. And one morning you wake up and it's 20 feet, 25 feet lower because Nobody saw everything looked good on the surface, but underneath, there, for decades maybe, there's been erosion, a lowering of the water table, slow leading away, and eventually, there's, and it looks sudden, like there's a sudden collapse. That's been a long process leading to what you see suddenly happen. It doesn't usually occur very quickly. It's a process. A second thing I see in this passage is that defections and desertions often take place when things are going great. When everything's going good, look, I read it to you, read verse 7 again. He said, I brought you to this wonderful fertile land to eat his fruit, rich produce, you know, vineyards you didn't plant, houses you didn't build, all that stuff. He said, but then you came into that great place and defiled my land, made my inheritance detestable. Things were going great when Israel fell away from the Lord. I remember a story of the demons in hell talking about how they can make Christians fall away. And one of the demons says, ooh, ooh, take away their health. If they get sick, they'll curse God and die. And another one says, no, take away their wealth. If they have to live in poverty, they'll curse God. Another one says, no, 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 take away their Bibles. Then they can't read about how good God is. And in the midst of that, Satan himself walks in and says, you idiots, that's not how you make Christians fall away, by taking stuff away from them. He says, no, the way to get them to fall is to give them everything they've ever wanted and get their lives so full of abundance and they get so busy and distracted, they'll slowly put God back in a corner of their lives. Somebody once said, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And the end result often is the same. He just, God gets the, the crumbs of our life. We make the assumption that most people leave God when they're going through some crisis, some terrible time in their life, and they get mad at God. Well, some do. Obviously, that sometimes happens. But it actually seems there's more of a tendency towards people to start sliding and slipping away from God when everything's are going great in times of blessing rather than testing. It's when you're successful and you're prosperous and you're blessed 
that you are most vulnerable. You know, Proverbs 16, verse 18 says a verse that I think about frequently when I go skiing. Proverbs 16 says, pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit comes just before a fall. And that's usually when I'm falling, when I'm skiing. I'm doing pretty good. I'm going down the slope, and I'm thinking, boy, I bet the people in the chairlift are really impressed with me. Look how good. And that's usually when I did have a yard sale and just, you know, everything scatters all over the slope. Pride comes. Oh, when do you have a haughty spirit? Prideful. When everything's going good. David was at the zenith of his career as a king when he fell. Jonah had just led an incredible revival that brought an entire sinful city to repentance when he deserted. Elijah has just descended from a wonderful victory over hundreds of false prophets when he comes down and slides away. Peter's just gone through a week where it looks like Jesus is going to win over the whole city of Jerusalem. They're waving palm branches, big parade for Jesus. And at the end of that week, Peter deserts. We've seen too many other contemporary Christians, TV evangelists, and all and on, pastors of megachurches, who have fallen when everything was going great, was going their way. If you read the history of Israel, it's almost condensed in just a few verses in Nehemiah chapter 9. Listen to what he says, start in verse 25. God says, I helped them to capture fortified cities and fertile land. They took possessions filled with or possession of houses filled with all kinds of good things. Wells that had already been dung, dug, vineyards and olive groves of fruit trees that had already been planted. They ate to the full. They were well nourished. They reveled in your great goodness. Everything's going great. But they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They put your law behind their backs. They killed your prophets. They committed awful blasphemies. So you hand them over to their enemies who oppressed them. But when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. And from heaven you heard them. And in your great compassion you gave them deliverers who rescued them from the hands of their enemies. But as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. <clears throat> so you abandoned them to the <clears throat> hand of their enemies, so they ruled over them. Then they cried out to you again, and you heard from heaven, and you had compassion, and you delivered them time after time. You warned them to return to your law, but they became a but. They became arrogant and disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances, by which a man will live if he obeys them. Stubbornly they turned their backs on you, became stiff-necked, and refused to listen. For many years you were patient with them. By your spirit you admonished them through your prophets, but they paid no attention. So you hand them over to the neighboring peoples. But in your great mercy, you didn't put an end to them. You didn't abandon them because you are a gracious and merciful God. Man, did you just catch that roller coaster ride? I mean, you think the roller coasters at Dollywood are great. Man, that's the history of Israel. It, they always seemed to stray away from God when the enemies weren't attacking. Things were going great. And for those of us who, are, who those of you who may be here today that are more at my end of the age spectrum, may I say that retirement, the retirement years could be one of the most dangerous times in our lives because for most of us in our retirement years, we're comfortable. We're kind of proud of how we've dealt with our life. We went through, we didn't get a divorce, we did good with our investments, we're successful, and there's a temptation to just kind of sit back and enjoy the rewards and slack off and let our guard down. And this could be, if, if the tendency is to leave God when things are going great, then we need to be careful because that could be a characteristic of our retirement years. Well, desertions and defections, don't act, they don't happen quickly. It's usually a long, slow process. They often happen during times of great success, when things are going well. And another thing I see here in verse 8 is that they frequently happen during loose leadership, bad leadership. This is a scary part of the sermon and the lesson and the scripture for me because I'm a, I'm a church leader. Uh, James chapter 3 says, those of us that are in leadership positions will be judged more harshly because we have more responsibility the results of our failures have wider ripple effects. Scary verse for any of us that are paid or unpaid. You know, volunteers in the church, leaders. People can defect and desert 
if there's not good leadership. Look what he says there in verse 8. He lists four groups of leaders. He says, the priest never asked, where is the Lord? When the religious leaders aren't asking the people they're responsible for, where's God in your life? Is he close to you? Is he far away from you? Or basically you're far away from him? Is there something we can do to help restore, increase your intimacy with this great God we serve? says the religious leaders, the priests, weren't even asking, where is God? The second group he talks about, he says, those who deal with the law, the teachers of the law, don't know me. Man, that's amazing. Basically, the people who know the book don't know me. Have you ever known a, a Christian like that? I sure have in my lifetime. People who know the book, man, they can quote chapter and verse. And they're some of the biggest boogers you ever run into in your life. And they know the book, he said, but they don't know me. Then he talks about just generic leaders. He said, the leaders rebelled against me. When these are people that are living in sinful rebellion, and instead of leading the people towards God, they're leading people away from God. People are following their example. Again, the pressure on those of us that are in leadership, that we're not living in rebellion. And finally, he says, in the prophets, prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. They're, they're following the wrong gods. They're chasing after the wrong stuff. And I've known of churches where the leaders were, were chasing after other stuff. We wanted to be a, a notorious, a famous church. We wanted a big fancy church building. We wanted whatever else. He says, if you've got leaders who look at those four things, they don't really care a whole lot about where God is in the lives of the people. They don't have intimacy. They know the book, but they don't know the Lord. They don't have any self-control. They're living in rebellion. And they've got their priorities all messed up. If there's bad leadership, there is a chance that the people under those leaders will more easily defect and desert because they haven't been rooted by the leaders and led. Desertion and defection doesn't happen quickly. Usually happens when things are going good. Often happens if there's bad leadership or weak leadership. And a fourth thing I see in here is that uh, desertion and, de and defection involve two specific sins. And you can read about those. Look over at verse 11. <clears throat> has a nation ever changed its gods? He's talking about idols. And he said, they're not even really gods at all. He said, well, my people have exchanged their glory, their God, for worthless idols. You should be appalled at this. Shudder with great horror. My people have committed two sins. First of all, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And second, they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Two things they've done really bad in their desertion. They fors forsook God. That's bad enough. And then they went, back, went off and said, and I think I, can, I found something better than him. And they've dug their, they left the spring of living water and dug their own cisterns and their, their broken cisterns. They won't even hold water. Now, I, I'm assuming you know what a cistern is. In a dry land like Israel, the Middle East, not a whole lot of rain, and so you put gutters all around your house and channels down, and then you dig into the rock near your house and hollow out a big area out there, and when it, you do get some rain, it runs off the roof down those gutters and those channels into this cistern, so you've got some water. But it's not good water. Certainly not like you get from a nice clean spring. This water's come off the roof. There's dirt in it. There's sticks. There's leaves. There's birdie doo doo in there. I mean, that's not good water. You got to boil it and clean it up before you can drink this water. And he says, and not only that, have you exchanged this wonderful living water for that dirty, muddy water? There are sisters that won't even hold it. it. It cannot satisfy you. What an incredible description of the empty pleasures of this world, where you leave God, the spring of living water, and think, I've discovered something nobody's ever discovered, something better than God, a better way of living. That's a pretty prideful thought. I remember reading a story about three guys, high-rise hotel, catches fire. Fire trucks show up, the ladders won't reach, so they snap the little light, the net together, and they're saying, okay, we got it. One of you guys jump. And the first guy says, hey, I'm from Indiana, and I'm the CEO of a major corporation. I'm really important. I need to go first. And he jumps, and the guy's missing. Splat! Uh, hold on just a minute. You know, they kind of adjust their aim a little bit. So, okay, we're ready. And the second guy says, uh, you know, I just came up from Florida. <laughs> I, I run a big corporation. I run the villages in Florida. I'm very important to the whole company. I got to go next. And he jumps, and they miss him. Splat. 
I go, oh, hold on. And they kind of move and adjust. I said, okay, we think we're ready now. Well, the next guy's from East Tennessee. And he says, look, it's obvious you guys have no idea what you're doing. So you just lay that net on the ground and back away. <laughs> yeah. Think about that. I think, I think I know better than everyone else. I think I've found a better way. And I've found many people who've walked away from Jesus because they thought they found a better way to live. If, if and when you're tempted to do that, understand it's not going to be satisfying. It's just not going to be satisfying. It's, you're heading towards a broken cistern, muddy water, and it's just leaking away. I mean, leave the hope of eternity, the hope of heaven with my loved ones and with Jesus for the hopelessness of nothingness. To believe that you came from nothing, you're going to nothing, you get 70, 80, 90 years of pain and suffering, and that's it? You're going to leave... This hope for that hopelessness? You're going to leave a life of significance and purpose and service for a life of purposelessness? As the quote says, he who dies with the most toys still dies. It doesn't change anything. You're going to leave a life of, of purpose and service and significance for purposelessness and just trying to find up stuff to fill up your days? You're going to leave the meat and potatoes and milk of God's word for the cotton candy of this world that just says, I believe whatever you want to believe. Nothing's more true than anything else. The prodigal son, Luke 15, remember he did that. He thought he knew a better way to live. He cursed his God, took his money, and went off to the far country. And what did he discover? This wasn't a good decision. This wasn't a good way. My dad loved me. Man, did I have it made back home, and I'm living in this pig pen. And he discovered that the darkness wasn't as great as he thought it would be. I was discovered that if you're one of those people like I am who you've been raised in the light I've been going to church since the second Sunday after I was born and I'm 69 years old if you were raised in the light sometimes you don't appreciate it Eh, it's the light and sometimes we're tempted by the darkness and sometimes we do drift away and go flirt with the darkness and I pray like the prodigal son very quickly you discover oh this was a bad decision this isn't good that was the good place to be and you discover, as Jesus tells the story in Luke 15, the dad's looking out the curtain every day waiting for you to come home, come back. And when you raise the light, you didn't appreciate it, and then you've tasted the darkness and you come back to the light, you love it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Sometimes you don't realize what you have until you've lost it. And the good news is you can come back. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But one more insight, and that is that desertion and defection will provide their own consequences. God doesn't have to punish you for walking away from him. That in itself is your punishment. I read it there in verse 19. Uh, uh, in the passage there, he says, your wickedness will punish you. Your backsliding will rebuke you. It will be evil and bitter for you if you forsake the Lord. I've known a lot of people who have defected or deserted, as I said. I've never met one who was genuinely happy. Whoever said, there, Dave, you ought to do this. These have been the best years of my life. I've got a letter I keep in this little file here from a kid who was in my youth group, incredibly involved in my youth group. Went on all of our summer trips to Christ and youth conferences. Incredibly involved in all. Went to a Christian college in California and then walked away from all of it. This is an email he sent me several years ago and it's filled with phrases like this. I'm haunted. I mourn. I yearn. Everything in this letter, Chris is saying, this wasn't a good decision. This isn't a good way to live. I missed the way it used to be. And, and he's been, but he was so reluctant to come back. There will always be that if you decide to defect and, and just go out and I'm just going to choose to live my life, there will be an initial exhilaration, a, a rush in the rebellion. I mean, the Bible says sin has its pleasure for a season. Sin's fun for a while. If sin wasn't fun, nobody would sin. So it's going to be, there's going to be that initial rush, that shocking the old prudes, experiencing forbidden delights, but it doesn't last for long. And the w muddy water in the cistern begins to leak away, and the prodigal son found him in the himself in the pig pen, and you discover, what, what, what was I thinking? Uh, my little dog, Toya the Wonder Dog, who is dead now. I was walking him one night years ago, and as we were walking, he saw a skunk that I didn't see. 
And we're just walking along, enjoying the moonlight. So poof, the leash was gone. He's off chasing that skunk. That skunk's waddling off. And man, I went after her. I'm an old guy, but you should have seen me that night. And I'm running after him. I'm screaming and yelling at Toya. And, and um, he probably thought I was mad at him. And I finally caught up with him enough to step on his leash. And he went, and yanked him back. And I grabbed him. And I'm sure he thought I was a meanie, spoiling his fun. But I was pursuing him because I love him. I didn't want him to suffer the consequences of catching the skunk. I didn't want to suffer the consequences of him catching the skunk. Oh, running away. But you can come back. Because Father God, if you decide to leave, and you can try for 500 miles, when you decide to come back, you turn around, guess who you bump into? The Lord. He's been chasing you. Look what he says in chapter 3 of Jeremiah. If you want to flip over just a couple of pages. Verse 12, he says, return. I, I will frown on you no longer. I'm merciful. I will not be angry forever. Just acknowledge your guilt. You have rebelled against the Lord your God. You scattered your favors to other gods. And then if you skip over to verse 22, he says this. Um, Return, faithless people. I will cure you of backsliding. And you will come back to the Lord your God. That sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? Yeah, you're right. I mean, God didn't even sound angry there. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that, that sounds like I've got another chance, or my loved ones that I care about who've walked away. Sounds like they've got another chance. Yep, that's right. You can come back, but it's better just to hang on and not ever leave in the first place and suffer those consequences. I read a story. Steve Brown was speaking at a church, and they were having a carry-in dinner, and across the table from him was this big, early guy, tattoos, and Steve said, I want to hear your story. And the guy said, well, that's an interesting story. He said, I used to be with Hell's Angels. He said, you may not know this, but your commitment to Hell's Angels is lifelong. You can't ever leave. If you try to leave Hell's Angels, they kill you. The only way you can ever leave Hell's Angels is if you get converted to Jesus, because then they don't want you around anymore. He said, but if you say you've converted to Jesus and leave Hell's Angels, he said, Steve, they watch you. And if they sense that that was just something you were saying to get out of Hell's Angels and you're not sincere, they'd kill you. Steve, Steve, he said, I'm the most faithful church attender this church has. <laughs> I'm here every time the doors are open. I carry a big five-pound family Bible. Because not only was his conversion sincere, he wanted them to see that I'm hanging on to this. This is something I'm totally, completely committed to. There's a... Uh, Henry Dempsey was a pilot of a commuter airline up in Maine. And on one of his flights... He had his co-pilot take over, and Henry walked back through the little you know, 14-seater plane because the steps that come down out of the tail of the plane hadn't latched, the indicator light shows. And when he was reaching down to try to click him up, it popped open and sucked Henry Dempsey out of the plane. Well, the, all the warning bells are going off in the cockpit. Co-pilot calls for an emergency landing. Ten minutes later, they land, and that's when they find Henry. He had managed to capture the last rung on the steps and it held on at 4,000 feet for 10 minutes. And he was all scarred and scratched up because he'd been bouncing along the pavement as the plane landed. And here's my favorite part of the whole story. It took airport personnel several minutes to pry Dempsey's fingers from the ladder. <laughs> Absolutely, buddy. I'm hanging on because there's no place else to go. I've learned what Jill learned in C.S. Lewis's wonderful little book in the Chronicles of Narnia, The Silver Chair one of the seven books. And Jill has been brought into the land of Narnia and she's had all these adventures and it's really been a terrible experience for her so far. And she's dying of thirst in this forest and she comes out into a clearing and there's a beautiful, delicious, clear stream. But between her and the stream is this massive, beautiful lion laying in the grass. And she doesn't know what we know. Every time you see Aslan the lion, that's Jesus. Every time you see Aslan the lion, you think Jesus. She doesn't know that. She sees this lion, she's thirsty, and she says, uh, may I, uh, would you mind going away so I could get a drink? 
And the lion answered her just with a look and a very low growl. And she realized, gazing at his bulk, she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. But the delicious rippling noise of the brook was driving her frantic with thirst. Uh, do you promise uh, not to do anything to me if I come drink? I make no such promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had actually taken a step closer. Uh, do you... Uh, do you eat girls? I have swallowed up girls and boys and women and men and kings and emperors and cities and realms. Now, he didn't say this as if he were boasting or as if he were sorry, as if he was angry. He was just stating it like a fact. Oh, well, then I dare not come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh, dear, said Jill. I suppose that means I must go and search for another stream. And the lion said, Jill, there is no other stream. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven that we could be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. In John 6, Jesus gives a hard teaching. All the, all the crowd, several thousand people get up and just walk out on him. You know, if he's not going to do any more magic tricks and give us free snacks, we're out of here. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, you guys going to leave too? And Peter basically says, <clears throat> well, we would, but we don't have any place else to go. And that's really a wonderful place to, to be at. And I'm 69 years old, and I'm beginning to realize I'm here. I'm still here. Believe it or not, after all the ups and downs and everything else, I'm still here. You know, watching all these other people slip away, and it breaks my heart. And then the question goes, so why am I still here? And I think it has to do with truth. You know, Peter, when Jesus says, you guys are going to leave, Peter says, look, we have believed and we know the truth. And once you see the truth, you can't ever unsee it again. You can try to, but two plus two is always going to be equal four. That's the truth. You may not like it when you're balancing the checkbook, but it's not up for a vote or a majority rule. And no matter how sinful I am or how much I'm tempted to run and hide or get tired of all this, it doesn't matter. This stuff is still true whether or not I'm always even a good example of it. This is still the truth. But it could be, you know, that some people <clears throat> walk away from faith in Christ because they never really ever knew him. They never really fell in love with him. They thought this was all about you know, keeping up religious appearances and doing religious things and going to religious activities and escaping hell and, and all of that. And they thought it was just doing religious stuff. And after a while, that got old, and so they just walked away. Christianity isn't nearly as much a religion as it is a relationship. So why am I still here? Some of it has to do with this. This is just the truth, whether you like it or not. It's the truth, and I'm impressed with the truth, and I like the way this has told me to live. But it goes deeper than that. Jesus said, look, I'm not just coming to give you a book. I'm giving you me. I am the truth, the way, the life. And it's not just that I love this book and the truth. I love him, the capital T truth, because he's never done what he ought to with me, which has squashed me like a bug. He's never turned me away. He's never said, you know what? I've just had enough of you. I've never been condemned by him, devalued, demeaned. He has loved me when I was bad, and he loved me when I was good. He has forgiven me, and he's accepted me, and he's walked with me when nobody else would. And I just love him dearly. So am I going to leave? <laughs> you a fruitcake? <laughs> Where else am I going to go? He's the only boat afloat. And sometimes I'll succeed, and sometimes I'm going to fail. But I'm going to follow him closely on occasion, and occasionally I'm going to wander away down my own path. Sometimes I'm going to be beat up or walking with a limp or just so tired I don't feel like taking another step. I'll be sinful sometimes and faithful sometimes. But I'm still here. And I'm going to stay here till the day I die. And he calls me home and makes me to be like him. I have decided to follow Jesus. The world behind me, the cross before me. Though none go with me, 
Still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. So Father, on behalf of all of us gathered in this room, I thank you that you've brought us this far. And if there's anyone here that's thinking about walking away from this, show them your love. Show them how empty and dark it is out there. For the ones that we do know and love, we're staying faithful, but we've got family, friends who have walked away. Let, let the little bubble that the demons blow out there that looks so appealing, let it burst quickly. And they'll see how dark it is and they'll come back to the light and love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Hold us tightly with bonds of steel to your heart, to your love, your grace, because we saw it all so clearly in Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for that, for bringing us this far, holding on to us, staying faithful when we were faithless. We saw all of that, learned all of that about you through your son, Jesus Christ. So we ask and thank you for all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I feel like God knows how easy it is for us to forget. I think um, when God created us, he knew that he was creating us as beings that were forgetful and sinful, that would lose sight of the main thing. And I think if you read through scripture, that's why God gives so many different signs, so many different covenants to follow. Um, we see in the Old Testament everything from the rainbow as a sign that God will never flood the earth again, or um, we see things like after Joshua led the people of Israel across the Jordan River into the promised land after spending 40 years in the desert, he had them build a tower, a pillar of rocks as a reminder for them. And that's exactly what Jesus did with communion. He gave us communion so that we would remember so that we would keep our eyes focused on him, that, so that we would have a practice to help us focus on the truth of his word. So on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. Take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's coming around with the bucket for your all's um, communion cups. Dispose of those. And I invite you guys, if you want and if you will, uh, stand with us. We're going to worship with last, the last two songs. deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. And how great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away And as wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to
behold the man upon a cross and my sin upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers and it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished and his dying breath has brought me life and I know that it is finished. And I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. And why should I gain from him? His wounds have paid my ransom. And why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, and you're the one that guides my heart. And Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. And holiness is Christ in me. And where you are, Lord, I Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. 
So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand up on you, because Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you, God. Because Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Thank you everyone tuning in online. We appreciate that you guys are taking your time and still joining us in worship. Um, for you guys on this side, I ask that you guys exit through this back door. If you feel led to give, there's an offering plate there. For you guys on this side, exit the side door. Um, once again, it's really great to see all of your faces here in person. And I pray the Lord be with you and that we'll see you guys next Sunday. May the Lord's peace be with you. You're dismissed, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>